Amen. You may be seated. I will sing. I will sing, sing, sing to my God, my King. For all else fades away. And I will love, love, love with this heart you made. For you've been good always. Sing that again. And I will sing. And I will sing, sing, sing to my God, my King. For all else fades away And I will love, love, love With this heart you made For you've been good My God, my King, for all else fades away, and I will love, love, love with this heart you've made, for you've been good always, for you, for you've been good always. strength and song I his praise to him belong Christ the Lord the conquering King your name we raise your triumphs sing so praise the Lord our mighty warrior praise the Lord the glorious one by his hand we stand in victory and by his name we overcome though the storms though the storm of hell pursue in darkest night we worship you you divine Shall reign forever and 
and ever the Lord shall reign forever and ever the Lord shall reign forever. Let's stand together. We'll sing that again. The Lord shall reign. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. So praise the know um, that we overcome because you will overcome. The Lord reigns forever and ever. The darkness, Lord, is, is evident and we see it um, around us, but yet, Lord, there's great hope, a gr the greatest hope, because we know that you will reign forever. I love it that you will get the last word. So we pray, Lord, that we would be reminded and, and, and grab onto that for hope, for our lives, and for the ministry, Lord, that, that's happening here. We, we thank you for it. Again, we thank you for it, and we pray that you'd continue to bless it, Lord, and use this offering for that purpose and that purpose alone, for your glory, for your ministry, for your kingdom's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Sing that again, everyone needs. And everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever the author of salvation and he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave Take me as you find me, and all my fears and failures, and fill my life again. I give my life and everything I believe, everything I believe in. the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the 
believe that right he conquered the grave hey take a moment say hi to somebody nearby you Um, as the, um, uh, the, the guys come forward to, to bring the offering, I'm going to um, give us some announcements. So um, my name is Brian Gallagher. I'm one of the assistant pastors here, and I just have a couple of quick announcements for us this morning before we continue with our worship service. Um, first of all, um, I don't know if we did this first service. How about we just, instead of making you stand, how about if we just do a little hand-raising exercise? Who here graduated from either high school, college, or some other kind of trade school. When? Now. This, <laughs> now. Now. Uh, ever. No. This spring. This spring. This spring. All right, everybody. Good job. Hey, for our, our graduates, for our graduates, we have a special gift for you. We just want to say congratulations from Calvary Chapel Central Bucks from your from your church family. So please stop by the counter out in Fellowship Hall. We want to just give you a little gift and say congratulations on your accomplishment. Um, you may have noticed underneath the tent out in the parking lot there at one of our parking spots, lots of goodies. Um, but those goodies go for a good cause. So please stop by the junior high. Um, the junior high girls are holding a bake sale today to benefit Nepal. We are, we, we are our own ongoing support of Nepal and the work that's going on over there. So please stop by today, get some goodies and um, delicious baked goods, and it'll help support Nepal. And the junior high um, youth group is really busy today because besides selling delicious baked goods, there's wonderful, beautiful plants out there that also benefit, the, benefit their missions trip that they're going on this summer down to Philadelphia. So please stop, buy some plants, buy some brownies and some cookies, go home, it'll be a good day. So um, please do that. A couple of other quick reminders. This Wednesday, great, great evening of all church worship. So please come out this Wednesday. It's, a family, it's time for the family to just come together and just praise and worship the Lord together. So it's multi-generational worship. Just come on out and, and bring, bring your kids, bring grandparents, bring them all. And we'll just worship together, okay? It's at 7 o'clock right here. And my son's favorite part, just dessert in the cafe afterwards. So, um, so come on out for that. The senior high missions, uh, we still are looking for school supplies. The senior hires go down to Dominican Republic and we bring school supplies to the children, the needy children down in Dominican. So there's a box out in Fellowship Hall where you can just drop your, your donations. Um, so that would be greatly appreciated. Kid Camp at Calvary, we're still um, advertising it for, for young people to, show, to, to sign up. It's a great opportunity. It's a three-day camp all about Jesus Christ, 
all about reaching the community around us. So um, if you have kids looking for something to do this summer, we have three good days, July 13th through the 15th, 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. right here on this site. We're gonna transform this place into Nazareth. So come on out, bring your kids out. And if you don't have kids, but you wanna volunteer, we're looking for you too. So please do that, please sign up. And by the way, if you have signed up, if you are a, a, a minister, children's ministry volunteer, we have background checks available for you to grab and, and, and complete. So, um, and of course, children's ministry, speaking of that, we're always continuing to look for summer help. If you can just, for a couple weeks in the summer, step in, stand in the gap, fill in for the people who take a little break in the summer who normally do it. So we, we, we'd love to have you do that. So just see us out there, talk to Bridget, talk to Becky, talk to any one of us, and we'll get, make sure we find a slot for you. Hey, if you're new or you're visiting, there's a, there should be a welcome card in a seat in front of you. It looks like this. So if you don't mind, just fill it out, leave it with me or with RB or with Pastor Steve out in, the, in Fellowship Hall. We, we just want to know um, how to best follow up with you and how we can pray for you. Um, all this information and so much more on the website. Please sign up for the e bolt if you haven't done so already. And of course, the prayer room will be, be um, open after worship, and there'll be prayer partners available up here after service. So please make use of those. And I know you've already done it. You see me come up here, and you just automatically grab your phone, and you make sure it's off. So um, I'm going to ask you to make sure that that's done. So before we get into the study of the Word this morning, um, we have a, a, a special treat, a special time of prayer we want to engage in. So I want to invite Katie and Betho to come on up, as well as Pastor John. You can come up, too. Where'd you go? Morning, everybody. You probably all have, uh, I don't know if you've ever, if you've actually met Katie and Betho, but you have seen them, depending upon whether you were here the last time or whether you were out for Peru night. But um, uh, Katie and Betho have been back here for the last six weeks, and they're leaving tomorrow to go back to Chota, where they're working on uh, church planning. So uh, you guys want to give us a, a little bit of a, just a real quick... Um, we leave tomorrow, we get back um, to Lima tomorrow night, um, and then Wednesday night probably, um, we will leave for Cajamarca, which is in northern Peru, um, that's a 16 hour bus ride overnight, so that, that'll be fun. And then um, shortly after that there's another, it'll be a four hour van trip to Chota. Um, so we'll most likely we'll get back to Chota on, on Thursday, which will be exciting, so pray for us please. <laughs> so they... Uh, Katie's from here and, and met um, Betho down at Bible College down in Peru. And uh, then God laid it on their hearts. If, if they got married, they went to Chocha to, to engage in church planning. So it's really exciting anytime God raises up people and he's doing it now. I know there's people in this fellowship that God is stirring hearts. And they're an example of heart stirred. The people who want to go out and they've been out and they're, uh, they've been back here uh, getting some time off and now they're heading back. So we want to take some time, and Steve here is head of missions, and Brian is one of the pastors. The three of us want to lay on hands and pray for them as they go back. So we should all do this together as a church. So why don't you stand with us, and then uh, let's pray. Go ahead. I'll close. Okay. Father, thank you, Lord God, for uh, uh, just um, the excitement, Lord. Uh, Lord Jesus, you said, you said, come unto me, and I'll give you rest, and then... We read later that Paul says, how will they ever come? How will they ever hear about you and about this enormous gospel that we have unless someone goes? And here we have two people and a, and a, and a, and a son, a husband, a wife, and a son that's ready to, to embark to some place that we can only imagine what it's like um, in the mountains of Peru. Um, the, good, the good part of it is a 16-hour bus ride. I can't imagine the rest, Lord. So... Father, with all our hearts, Lord God, we pray and we ask you to gift them in an enormous way, to give grace to them, to give traveling mercies, and, and even more, Lord, that when they hit the ground, Lord, there would be such opportunities for, for Betho and Katie to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ to people, Lord, that when the word is spoken, people would say, wow, that is good news. So we pray, Lord, that you would give, just give them grace and mercy. I pray that you would put angels before them. And everything that they do, Lord God, I pray that the door would be open in such a magnificent way that even their minds will be blown, Lord, as they see you working in action through them. So we pray, Lord, that Jesus would be lifted up in all that they do and all that they say that, uh, Lord, you would get the glory. Yeah. And in all of that, Lord, we know that um, they can choose to do many things because of their 
the desires that are on their hearts, yes. Lord, but it's only by the power of your Holy Spirit that there will ever be any fruit. And so, Lord, it's only by your Spirit that there's fruit. It's only by your Spirit that strongholds are broken, mm -hmm. Lord. It's only by your Spirit that the stronghold of religion, Lord, all those things are broken. Yes. And so we pray, Lord, that you would cover them uh, with your protection, with your protective hand, you'd pour out your Spirit upon them, Lord, and give them clarity in, in this work that you've called them to, Lord, to be patient in the work and at the same time to look to you for power and for fruitfulness, Lord. So we commit them to you. We commit this whole family to you and the one on the way to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. You can have a seat. Open your Bibles, please, to... Uh, Somewhere, let's see, where, where should we go? Uh, 1 Samuel, there we go. 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm, I'm in Chota. Uh, <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 3. And we've been kind of nibbling our way through this, and we're going to, I think I've said it before, sometimes we're going to take huge chunks, and sometimes we'll look at little pieces. Next week's a huge chunk, so please read ahead chapters 4 through 7. Is, uh, is an interesting, actually there's a lot that goes on there, and I also happen to think that it's one of those uh, passages where we really see the divine humor of God. So, um, so you can go read that for yourself and you'll see what I mean. Um, let's quickly pray. Father, we ask that you'd open our hearts to your word, Lord. We'd love to be able to come and to sing these songs of worship to you. And we know, Lord, that it's just as we prayed for Kate and Bethel, Lord, it's only by your spirit that strongholds are broken. It's only by your spirit that fruit is born. And in the same way as we read your word, Lord, we ask you because you're the author of the word and you indwell us by your spirit, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us, those of us who know you as Savior and Lord and King, Lord, that you would speak to us in those areas we, that need to be reached, Lord. And for those who don't know you, Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. And for anyone who's hurting today, Lord, that you would touch them, whether in their body or their spirit, and that you would comfort them, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you're about to do here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Chapter 3. And I guess I'd start with the question, how long has it been? since you heard God speak to you. Now, that's a controversial statement because people have all kinds of ideas and all kinds of ways of answering that question. And, and I want to explore it as we walk through chapter 3 because I think there are some pretty obvious um, answers in this chapter and in the rest of the word. But when we think of the days that we live in, we live in these days, I, I, the more and more as I see the things that are going on in our society, meaning in our country, in our society, and in the world, I, I'm beginning to feel like I'm living on an island and tsunamis are coming from every direction. And so whether we're talking about racial divide in our, in our country and especially in our uh, cities, whether we're talking about all kinds of social problems, political problems, uh, and you know, that's, we've always had you know, some of that. Uh, economic problems are getting larger and larger all the time. But then when we start to look at the moral state of our society, we look at, you know, we, uh, we talk about abortion all the time, but, you know, do we ever really try to wrap our minds around what that has meant for our country? 58 million abortions. And then those who weren't born as a result of those abortions you're up to 80 million people who are not a part of this society. And, and, and just the, the morality or the immorality of that alone. Now it, the, uh, things are, are escalating in our society. And, and, and we all know, I think we all know, that this summer the Supreme Court is coming down with a decision on um, same-sex marriage. And, and I suppose that in this room, you know, we're probably close to united on, on our opinion of that. We, you know, we, we, th we think of that or we think of, you know, uh, 10 years ago, I, I never would have thought that I would be using the word 
on almost a daily basis, if not multiple times a day, transgenderism. You know, we start to look at these, and these are only samples, and, I don't, and that's not where we're going today, but I'm just saying these are examples, and those, and those are just some samples of some of the things that are going on. And, and, and the way I see it, and I guess I said this Wednesday night for those of you who are here, sorry, it's a repeat, but it's, it's as if the waves are hitting the shore faster and a quicker velocity, and they're higher, they're bigger, they're hitting with, with more um, energy, more power, and it's a tough thing to watch. And, and as Christians, to take a stand and to say, I disagree with that. Actually, this is what God says. When we do that, and then we're accused, and, and I mean, I, I remember I went home Wednesday night, and I thought, right there, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the news and, 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 and being accused of hate speech for, for that. Being called a bigot because I feel that way. No, I'm, I'm not. But I, anyhow, all that said, we're living in this world that's getting darker. You know, we use that, that term all the time. We're living in this world that's, that's getting darker. And we, we, we've been reading through the judges. And of course, in 1 Samuel, we're still in the period of the judges. And, and, and it was encapsulated, you know, in, in, in judges, a number of places, but 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And increasingly, that's who we are as a nation and, frankly, the world. And so we see darker clouds on the horizon. And you say, well, I mean, there's a lot of things we say to that, but what do we do? Well, what happened? You know, man can only do so much. God is the one who's calling us to look to him. And it's important that, when, that we as believers, when we're in the midst of this, we're not going to change everything we have to maintain who we are and to and to, to be who god has called us to be and to walk the walk that god has called us to walk and not to go the way of, of everything else and just adapt the the attitudes of the society but stand for that which is right and and in a winsome way to to um to to engage the society but to stand for that which is true and, and so you look in the days of the judges, and we've, and we've spent some time looking at Eli and his sons Hophnius and, uh, Hophni and Phinehas. And, and here the priesthood was corrupt. What was going on in the tabernacle was corrupt. Um, you know, just to speak politically, I mean, it was, it, the whole period of the judges, for the most part, I mean, there were some bright spots, but there, it was corrupt. And I say it, it would have been easy there to despair as it is easy for a lot of people today to despair as we look at our society. But God had a man and God had a plan. And I think that's really important that, to understand that as we look at this, these transitional two books, or really one book, First and Second Samuel, going from the judges into the time of the kings. And so I, I say that as we work through this, because we see this young man, Samuel, who is a young man now, he's, a, 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 he's 12 or 13 years old, according to Josephus. And, and he's, he's been at the tabernacle for five years. He's been working faithfully. He's, he's ministering to the Lord and he's serving um, before Eli, the priest. And he's doing the work that God has called him to do. And, he's, and it would have been easy for him to have been corrupted by Eli's sons. But he maintains this purity. As he, as he continues to do the work that he's, that he's called to do. We're going to look at most of the verses in this chapter, but we're going to spend a lot of time on the first verse. So let's just look at that for a second. It says, now the boy Samuel, and he's really, like I say, don't think of a little boy anymore, six years old or something. Uh, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Key phrase. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Your Bible may say it was precious in those days, like in other words, virtually non-existence, non-existent. And there was no widespread revelation, or your Bible may say there was no open vision. The, the whole idea in Hebrew is that there was no, the, the, the word of God was not bursting through, was not revealing himself, and he wasn't revealing himself through visions or, or anything like that. So it was a very dark time. It was what we would call a dry time. Um, a dry time. You'd say there was a, a, a drought of the word. There was a spiritual drought in, in that society. Um, I mean, you think of just a, a regular, a natural drought. What happens as a result of a natural drought? If it goes on long enough, uh, agriculturally, you know, you can't grow, so it results in a famine. 
And as a result of a famine, then, you know, all kinds of things. But just in terms of our own bodies, weakness, disease, death, come to a society. And so that's what had been happening spiritually. So in the midst of all this darkness, because the word of God was rare, and there were no visions of the Lord, none of that was happening, uh, and it was so dark, there, there was this rotting that was going on. It's important that we understand it that way, because when we, when we talk about drought, it also applies to us. Now here's this Samuel, who in the midst of this darkness, he continues to minister to the Lord. He continues to, to do the right thing, to maintain purity in the way that he, uh, that, that he walks, the way that he's honest before the Lord. Um, he doesn't yet, we're going to learn, he doesn't yet have a real relationship with the Lord, but he certainly knows a great deal about him. And he's so different from the other guys, from Hophni and Phineas, You know, and why? Well, he's faithful. He's faithful to do the work and you can't write it off, all right? You can't write it off and say, well, it's the innocence of youth. I mean, he's, just, he's a young guy and he's just doing what the old man says to do. And that kind of, no, no. It's something about his heart. You know, the Lord says in, in Second Chronicles, says that the, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. He hasn't changed. He, he's the same today. So he's still doing that today. He's looking for young people and he's looking for older people whose heart is loyal to him. And, 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 and you know, you think of it, here's a, this young man. He was born, he had nothing to do with it. His mother, who was barren and, and who was broken and who was, and, and who was just flat out weeping and fasting before the Lord, swore to the Lord that if he would give her a boy child, that she would give him to the work of the tabernacle. And she held up her end of the bargain. God gave her this child, and she gave Samuel to work with Eli. She put him in this situation. He had no control of it, just as you and I had no control over what country we were born in, the family that we were born into. We had no control over that, but here we are. You know, and, and I recognize that, you know, probably most of us have read through or certainly are familiar with the story of Esther. And here's Esther. She had no control over this, and she had, it, was, it was against her will that she would even be taken, and now she was put into the situation with the king. And Mordecai, her cousin, is saying to her, and she's reluctant to do it. She doesn't even know half, the, you know, the 10% of the evil plan that was against her and all of her people. But Mordecai says to her, and we're very familiar with Esther 4, 14, he says, if you stay silent, like if you don't go before the king and you don't intercede, he says, if you stay silent, you know, be sure deliverance of the Jews will still come. He says, but you and your father's household will perish. Yet who knows but that you have been come into the kingdom for a time such as this. And who knows whether you or me or any of us here. We, the fact is it's not an if, it's the fact that all of us are here for such a time as this. We may not like what we see going on in our society right now. We may not like the darkness of our society right now, and I don't. But we were born into this time and we were reborn for this time. God has called us to stay here, not to flee from the darkness, but to be in the midst of the darkness as the light. He's called us for a time such as this. These are defi definitely very difficult times. The, the word of the Lord was precious. There was a drought. You know, God will say through Amos uh, about, I don't know, 400 years or a little bit more uh, after this, he'll say, he'll say, I am bringing a famine on the land. Not, not a, a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the word of the Lord. Well, that was the case then, but it, I mean, just look at our own society now. Look at, look at how many Bibles that we have. I, I, I mean, no show of hands, but we have so many Bibles in our house. I mean, I have a car Bible. 
Um, uh, actually, my, my, my old car Bible was falling apart, so I got a new car Bible. Now I have two car Bibles. You know, I've got to do something with my first car Bible. Uh, and, and, you know, we, I, I, Bibles in my office and Bibles, you know, in our house and people have Bibles in their bathrooms and people have Bibles everywhere. It's not a question of whether we have access to the Word of God. Think about even in churches, we have the Word of God. There's a lot of, he didn't say that in those days there's going to be a famine for the, for the preaching of the Word of God. We don't have a famine for the preaching of the Word of God, certainly not in America. It's a famine for hearing. And, that, and, that, and the hearing, with that word, because it comes up later on in this, in this chapter, hearing isn't, you know, a sound wave bouncing off of an eardrum. That's not what he's talking about. Hearing, listening, has to do with obeying. Okay, so hearing, getting it, and doing it is the idea. That's the famine that God speaks of in Amos. Now, I realize that's future from, from what we're looking at here in Amos, or excuse me, in Samuel, but it's the same type of thing. There's a famine for the hearing of, of the word of the Lord. You know, you, you just look around at, at the church today, and I recognize it. There are many churches. There are many places called churches in America and around the world who practice a form of religion that many of the people even in it say, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I do it. They don't get it. And if we walked in there, we'd say, we might use words like, well, this is dead or this is meaningless. Or we, we might say things like that. And I totally understand. We're in a society where people who are working are working you know, longer hours than ever before. We're stretched more than ever before. And you finally get a day off and it's like, I'm not going there. I wouldn't want to go to a place like that where I'm not getting fed if I'm not receiving the word of the Lord and I don't have an opportunity to worship with the saints. But we live in a time where we have so much technology and we have the word of the Lord. We, we have podcasts. I mean, you know, I, love, I, I work outside, I you know, cut the lawn or I'm doing something like that, I, or I'm driving my car, I'm listening. I mean, the pastor's got to be taught, you know, right? so I'm, I'm listening. I've got earbuds in when I'm working outside and doing that kind of thing. And so, I, I mean, I want to hear. I want to know what's, what's going on. And sure, I listen to music too, but I, 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 like to, to, I like to hear Bible teaching. But there's something different about worshiping together. You know, here, here's it. My, my dad died about four years ago, but up until, almost up until he died, he was, he was right up against 90 years old. You know, he would say, hey, you know, can you, well, in the earlier days, he said, can you bring me a cassette? Um, we don't do cassettes. And so it was, uh, how many people here remember eight tracks? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's more than I thought for this verse. Okay. Um, so, and, and then when we, when we stopped doing cassettes, I had to like transition them over to CDs. Like, this is how you use it, Dad, you know. And, you know, at a CD player, this is how you listen to it. But that's in my bedroom. I want it out in my living room. Well, we'll just move it out. Anyhow, so we worked through all of that. And, and he was, you know, my dad's, he was such a charming guy and gracious guy and, um, and a salesman. And, and so I... You know, I, I get the stack of like, uh, you know, uh, cassettes from him. I, like I, I've listened to all of these. I <laughs> take them back, you know, and I say okay, and I take them. He said, you know, so, some are better than others. <laughs> I'd say okay. That's a, <laughs> you know, sometimes you hit the ball and sometimes you don't, Dad. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. He was so funny that way. And and but every I could tell you, every single time that he walked into this room and worshiped with us. He would walk out and either in the foyer, in the parking lot, or by the time we had lunch, because that's usually what it resulted in, he'd say, that was powerful today. I said, well, it's not what I said. He said, well, it's sure different from what I listen to sometimes on the CDs. You know, well, that's because the Holy Spirit's not on the CD. The Holy Spirit is here among the saints. We're worshiping together. By the way, that's part of the, we're a podcast society. We're a live stream society. We like to look at, you know, who's teaching what, where, when. But you know, there's nothing like worshiping together with the saints. Is that me? That's not me. Um, really, there isn't. There's nothing like worshiping together with the saints. <laughs> you know, Paul or whoever you think wrote, wrote Hebrews is going to say in Hebrews 10, Verse 25, 
he said, and do not forsake the assembling together of the saints. And, and he says, there's, there's really three key ideas. Do not forsake, it's a command. Don't forsake the assembling together of the saints. Second concept, as some are in the habit of doing. Some who? Some believers, some Christians. But all the more, meaning get together, but all the more as you see the day approaching. Don't forsake the assembling together of the saints as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another as you see the day approaching. What? The day of Christ. As times get darker and we move up to that time, we need to be together. We need to worship together. We need to study the word together and to, and to sing together and to, and to invite the Holy Spirit to move among us and do the work that he wants to do and then stay together and, to, and, the, and the fellowship together is to encourage one another. I mean, I, that, that, we could stand there, stay there for the rest of the morning. I'm not going to. But So I say this because there can be times of drought, times when you sense a drought in your own life. But God has an answer to that. And part of it is just get together with the saints. Worship together with the saints. I mean, I've often heard people, and you may be one who said it to me. That's not the point. It's not, it's not like, it's not a wrong thing. It's a, I always find it interesting when, you know, if I haven't seen someone for a while, they'll say, oh, but I listen on, online. Like, I'm not, it's, I'm, not, I'm not the truant officer, for those of you who remember what truant officers are, you know? <laughs> it's not a playing hooky thing, you know? It's just, it, it's good, it's healthy for the body to be together, you know? So, all right, so I said we would spend a lot of time on verse 1. We're going to move pretty fast through this. He says, and it came to pass, verse 2, at that time, when Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he couldn't see. I mean, there's no cataract surgery in those days. This guy's, Eli's probably early, 90, early to mid-90s by now. It's going to be 98 when he dies. And so, and before the lamp of God, that's the menorah, went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was. And while Samuel was lying down, so this is like late at night or early, as before the sun's coming up, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here I am. And so he ran to Eli, and he said, here I am, for you called me. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Lie down again. And he went, and he laid down. You know, I always, always wonder, what would God sound like if he called? Samuel! No, it freaked the guy out, right? I mean, he thought it was Eli. I don't think Eli sounded like that. So it's probably a, a gentle masculine voice and he figures it's Eli so and and that, that gives you an indicator too of what Samuel is like he's there helping Eli he's there to to serve his needs and so he says go uh, lie down again so he went and he lied down um, and and it says um, then the Lord called yet again Samuel so Samuel arose and he went to Eli and he said here I am for you called me and he answered I didn't call you my son lie down again. I think the, the first question before we really go into the rest of this is, are we listening? You know, because here's God intervening in a person's life. He's intervening in the life of someone who's already faithful. He's doing the things of the Lord in the tabernacle. He's serving the Lord. He was open to hear what God had to say. There's a lot of ways that we can shut out or try to shut out what the Lord is trying to say to us. It happens to all of us. This is not a blame issue. We all do it. It's part of the human condition. And God actually is reaching out to every single person on planet Earth because it's, it's not God's desire that any would perish but that all would come to salvation. So if that's the heart of God, then he is reaching out and he is, quote unquote, speaking to us one way or the other in order to draw us to himself. People have all kinds of opinions about that and they go into their camps, Calvinism, thing. we go by what the Bible says. And the Bible says that God is reaching out. And so he's in, uh, communicating or seeking to, to communicate with, with us. And there's a point at which each one of us finally does make the decision. I will step further or I will not. And the last I will not before we die determines where we spend our eternity. And so I know in this room right now, 
There are people I know that God is reaching out to. I know in this room right now that God is speaking to people in this room and saying, come to me. I've already paid the price. I love you. All of your sins have been paid for. If you receive that personally, you can know that your sins are forgiven. You can be in heaven with me, and I will give you an entirely new life, a life that's worth living beyond your wildest imaginations. It's amazing how many people would say no, and yet all you have to do, if I'm speaking to you, is to say, yes, I want that. And if that's your desire, you can receive Jesus Christ today, right where you're sitting. If, if you say, Lord, I, I, I want to be saved, you're saved. He, if that's your desire, if you believe that he paid the price for your sins, if you believe that, Christ, that God ro- raised him from the dead, then you're saved. He did it for you. You're saved. But he is also communing, communicating or seeking to reach out and to communicate with every single one of us in this room, with those of us who are believers. And it's amazing how much we don't really listen that much to what he has to say. I mean, you you just look at God uh, throughout the scripture. I mean, right from Genesis, Adam is created and, and, and the Lord walks with Adam in the garden in the cool of the day. He's reaching out to him. He's, he's communicating. They have relationship with one another. Chapter 3. They're hiding from God. And the Lord comes. Adam, where are you? He knows where he is. The, uh, the Lord never asks a question. He doesn't already know the answer to. Where are you? He does that with us. Have you ever noticed that when you're sitting with the Lord, whether you're, you're having a time with the Lord and you're, you're reading his word or you're praying, and there is a sense sometimes, often for me, where I sense the Lord saying, where are you, John? What's happening? What's going on? Because he's trying to draw me in to say, we, we need to work on this in your life. We need to straighten this out. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one he seeks to do that with. I'm pretty sure, from what I read in the scripture, that that's his desire to each of us. Because life in Christ is a walk. It's progress. That's what walk implies. And so he's always seeking to draw us closer to him. It says here, verse 7, that now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. That's, you know, we use that phrase, to know the Lord, um, and, and that, we use that in a Christian context. To be saved is to know the Lord, to have relationship with the Lord. And, and so we're not, this is a different covenant we're talking about, but the same God, and he wants relationship with Samuel, wants Samuel to have relationship with him. He didn't yet know the Lord, it says, for nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. God had not opened his word. Now, when it says that, the first thing we think about is our Bibles, the word of God. We say, this is the word of God. No, there, there were some things written down at this time. I mean, the, the Torah, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, they were written down. Uh, I presume that, you know, the, 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 the historical events during the time of Joshua were written down in some semblance. I don't know what, we're not told. Were, the, were the, the events of the times of the judges written down? Well, probably some pieces were written down. A lot of it was oral tradition, hadn't been assembled yet. That's it at this point. Historically speaking, that's where we are in the timeline. So when we say the word of the Lord, we think Bible. Here, we're talking about the speaking of the word. The speaking of the word of the Lord, because he appeared to people and he spoke to certain people during that time in a way that he doesn't actually today, for the most part, do today. And so, uh, and I'll just say for, for the most part because that's not the norm, but he wants us to know how to know his voice or his word. Okay, so uh, Samuel did yet, not yet know the, the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and so he arose and he went to Eli and he said, here I am, for you did call me. Now I put the emphasis on that, but you know, maybe he thinks Eli's playing a game. I don't know what he's thinking, you know, but come on, three times? You did call me. 
I know, I heard it. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boys. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down. And it shall be, if he calls you, that and you should circle this in your Bible. It shall be that if he calls you, you must. Like, he didn't say, here's an idea you might try. If he calls you, you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears, or your servant is listening. I just prefer that for the King James. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went, he laid down in his place. And, and that's the idea, to, to hear, or to say, your servant is listening. Um, we use the term, or the phrase sometimes, listen up. We've probably all said it to our kids at some point. Listen up. What does that mean? Do what I'm about to tell you. Right? So he says, your servant is listening. What is he saying? I'm ready to obey what you're going to say to me. That's what's going on here. And that's an important concept to get. Because it, as we transfer it over then to in our relationship with the Lord and in how we read the word, are we willing to sit before the Lord and say, here I am. Your servant is listening, ready to obey. Before we read it and have decided, uh, I like that, oh, I don't like that. Before we do that, but rather to say, whatever you reveal to me, I'm willing to do. Uh, I'm, in pro I'm in process too, okay? I'm not saying any of us have arrived, but that's really the standard that God is, is calling us to. So, and we read here, now the Lord came and he stood and he called, and, and note this, as at other times. We, you might think that what's happening is that he stood there and called to Samuel as he had the three other times in this chapter. I don't think that's what it means. And I'll show you why in a moment. But my, my suggestion is, as he once had before the days of the judges, before this great darkness came in, now he's standing there as at other times, and he called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. People, and I've heard people um, through the years, especially since I've been a pastor, say, you know, the Lord has told me this, or the Lord has told me that. And, th and that comes out different ways. You know, sometimes people actually say it. I heard the Lord say or the Lord told me. The Lord told me about you. Uh, you young adult women. If some guy says that the Lord told me that you should marry me, you say, well, he hasn't told me that. And when he tells me that, we'll talk, okay? But, um, and, and, and really, if, if the Lord, if someone tells you that the Lord has told them something about you, then really, be careful about taking it on. Because the fact of the matter is, we hear, quote unquote, in our spirit, things all the time. Now, how do you know is always the big question. Is it really the Lord? Is it just my desires, my flesh? Or is it the devil? How do I know who it is, where this voice is coming from? That's why we have the completed canon of scripture. We have the full canon of scripture and we can test the things that come into our spirit against that. But people will say, I've heard the Lord say this. And I, I can't discount and say this never happens, the idea of actually hearing the audible voice of God. I, I felt better years ago when I heard you know, Billy Graham say, you know, I, I think... I might have heard the Lord speak to me once or twice. Well, I'm not sure. I felt, I'm good now. Okay? <laughs> because when, here's the deal. Because when someone says, the Lord has said to me, they just threw down the trump card. They won the game. Because if God said it, what have I got to say? Except to say, well, that doesn't jive with what the scripture says. I remember being in, at a place uh, long ago. I, I don't know if, uh, if Renee even remembers, but we were, we were at a coffee house somewhere one time, a Christian coffee house, and some guy was um, 
I'd been saved for, I don't know, a year or so, very excited, and you know, you expect that. that that's the norm. You expect that in a new believer. And he, um, he, was, he was ready to go overseas, and he wanted to bring the gospel to, I forget where it was, and um, I could see he had a ring on his finger. I said, you're married? He said, yeah, and have two kids. I said, so you're all going? No, no, no. I'm just leaving. I'm going I'm to leave them here. I said, really? Yeah, he said, God is putting this on my heart. I said, really? God is putting it on your heart to violate, I mean, no, I didn't say this. I, it was Because I was a young believer then. But I remember go, it was going through my head. God is putting it on your heart to violate the covenant of marriage and to, and to go and abandon your family and to do that. That's an interesting thing to do. Like, you know, he was doing it for his life. He was making a life change. So people say all kinds of things all the time. How do we know what really is the truth and how do we know whether someone really is doing what God is calling to do? And, and frankly, this, because this is an important question, it's not just a question, a question for ourselves, it's a question as parents, how do we train our children to, to read the Bible, to have time with the Lord and to read the Bible? And as grandparents, how do we do that? I mean, you know, you think of, this spills over into the area of prayer. How do we teach our kids to pray? I mean, it's, it's cute. It's for a while. When they're really young, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for this food. Amen. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Should, if I should die, before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. We probably all know those prayers, right? Now, if my kids, who are now, you know, they've, they've left the house, but I mean, if they were younger and they were all there, and they were saying, Dad is great, Dad is good, and we thank him for this food. Every day? I mean, that's, it. are you sincere? You really mean that? I mean, I don't want to hear that. I want communication. I mean, once or twice a week, that's fine if they want to say, but, you know, no. That's not what God wants. We want to teach our kids how to pray. And if you have children, and if you've, you've listened to them pray, a young child just, they believe. And so they believe if I ask God, he'll do it. And we've watched, raising kids, we watched that as they prayed, that their prayers would be answered. And it's like, why do their prayers get answered faster than mine sometimes, you know? It's like, then when you want to bring all your prayer requests to your kids, say, here, pray for these things, you know? <laughs> because they're sincere. They believe as a child, you know? That's what God desires from us. The Lord wants to draw near to us, and he wants to communicate with us. Not just communicate. He doesn't want to just hear us communicating to him. I'm making that up. But, you know, that, those, think of our prayers. Think of the things that we say. We, we bring the list. I need this, and I need this. Don't forget that. And how about this? And, you know, amen. Got to go to work. And I always get this sense of the Lord saying, uh, can we talk? Because he does want to communicate. See, it's not that God doesn't want to speak with us, and it's not that God doesn't speak with us. He does. It's the, it's the manner in which, it's the medium over which or through which that he communicates with us. And he does draw near. James says it, if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. When we look through the Old Testament, we can see how God used to speak to, to people, whether we're talking about Noah or we're talking about Enoch, for that matter, or Abraham or Moses. I mean, we can go back to Jacob and Moses. And, 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 and you can start to work your way through and then later on the prophets and how God would reveal himself. And he did reveal himself in, in visions. He did reveal himself in dreams. Very often we think, I had a dream and this must mean this. How do you know? You have to test it because I'm not Moses and I'm not Noah and I'm not Abraham and I'm not in that position. And I am under a different covenant and the covenant I'm under says in the New Covenant, New Testament, Hebrews. Here, I'll read this to you, the first three verses of Hebrews chapter one. God who at various times and sundry ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person 
and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he, Jesus Christ, when he had purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Those three verses blow my mind. I mean, you can, you can study them for days, just those three verses for days about who Jesus Christ is and what he's accomplished for us. And by the way, and he sat down. If you have any doubt about it, it is finished you know, in the tabernacle and in the temple, there were no seats like these. There were no seats for the priests to sit down. They continued to work. In fact, in Hebrews, he makes the case, day after day after day offering sacrifices, right? But when Jesus had offered up himself as a sacrifice for us, he sat down, right? It was finished. The work is done. My, my sins have been purged. Paid for. Paid in full. Okay, but as to how God speaks to us. In times past, he used to speak this way. But in these days, he did this. In these last days, he did this. His very own son, God incarnate, God in the flesh, has accomplished these things. He's spoken to us. He's revealed his character through his son, Jesus Christ, who did these things for us and proved it by raising from the dead. God has revealed us himself in a different way. And, and the word of God, the, 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 the spoken and then written word of God that has been now given to us, I'm always astounded by the number of people who are Christians who are more interested in what someone else says that's not written in the Bible than what is written in the Bible. This is God's word, right? This is where we find out about who he is. And again, in Hebrews chapter 4, the word of God is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper even than a double-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit. I don't know that place. He does. It divides between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and it, and it alone, by the Spirit of God, is a discerner of the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Key words, thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Because the mind processes. This is the database. This is where we process the information. But this is the chooser. The, the, the heart determines. The heart will always make a convert out of the mind. Right? And the mind will come up with all kinds of ideas, but it comes from the heart. And we're to guard our hearts. You know, we go through the word of God, we learn all of these things, but it's only as we go through the word of God. And, you know, and, and I know that as I speak some of these passages, they're very familiar to many of us. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Doctrine. What is doctrine? That which is good. T doctrine teaches us what is good. Reproof. What is not good. That's what reproof is. It's about what is not good. Correction. How to get good or how to get right training in righteousness how to stay right that's what the word of god is about it's really quite uh, i'm gonna say simple but in a sense and when you just think of it that way that's what god does with his word when we are willing to say your servant is listening i'm ready to obey what you tell me so He says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I'm ready to obey. The same man, Samuel, by the time chapter 15 comes around, he's an old man. Saul is the king. And Saul has blown it a number of times as the king. Chapter 15, and we'll get there, but he says, Samuel rebukes him. He says, to obey is better than sacrifice. As much as God has called uh, the, you know, the believer to, sat, to offer a sacrifice under the Old Covenant, and Saul was kind of sh schmoozing Samuel, he says to obey. To obey God's word and what he told you to do is better. That's what God desires. To obey is better than sacrifice. Well, okay, so what happens here is that the, 
the, the Lord says to Samuel, I'm about to do something that is going to make the people's ears tingle. That, we don't say it that way. We say it today, that would blow your mind. Okay, that's what he's basically saying. It'll, it'll blow you away what I'm about to do. And he, and he tells Samuel that what he is about to do is to, is to bring judgment on the house of Eli and on his sons for the things that Eli has allowed them to do. In other words, not for the things he didn't know about, but for the things he did know about but did nothing to correct. So as parents, we need to take that one into account. Um, he says, I'm going to bring judgment on them. And... I can't, if, you, if you're 12 years old and you're Samuel and you've heard this from, from God, when you open up the doors of the tabernacle in the morning and come out and there's Eli standing there, you're, what are you thinking? I hope he doesn't ask me what God said, right? He doesn't want to say. And what's the first thing Eli say? What the Lord say to you? <laughs> so he tells him. And, and Eli, you know, he says, well, it sounds like the Lord. I'm paraphrasing. Let him do what he's going to do. Jump down to verse 19. So Samuel grew. There's a big transition here that gets us to chapter 4. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Remember, the test of a prophet, one of the tests, but one of the key tests of a prophet, is that everything the prophet says will happen, will happen. So he let none of his words fall to the ground, and nothing, nothing you know, turn into a disaster. Um, and all Israel, all of Israel, the entire nation, from Dan to Beersheba, from Maine to Florida, from New York to California, from sea to shining sea, okay, you know, whatever you want to call it, right? The entire land, all Israel, says, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. And then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. See what's going on here? It, it, it said earlier that the Lord appeared as he had at previous times, he says, um, he says here that he appeared again in Shiloh. In other words, the, the cloud was lifting. There was something new that was going on here. And, and that's because God had a man and he had a plan that he was going to work through, through Samuel. The Lord appeared again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. There's an appearance of the Lord to Samuel here. That's not something we see today. In fact, when people say, I saw God, and, and you know, there, there are times where people will say, um, you know, I, I, I have conversation. I remember being, a, you know, an elder in a, in a church. And, and the pastor and I went over to visit someone who was saying that she was have, having regular conversations with, I forget if it was Moses or one of the prophets, on, on her bed. I mean, you know, he'd sit on the side of the bed and tell her things, and she'd write them down. And it's like, no, this isn't right. That's not what happens. They don't come back and sit on your bed and tell you that we have the word of God. We have, and, and that's where we find from God what he has for us. The Lord will do mighty things with the disciple who will follow him, who's willing to listen to him. To any one of us in this room who knows Jesus Christ is our Savior, if we're willing to say, I give myself to you, Lord, and on a regular basis to say, I'm going to sit before you and I want you to communicate to me through your word, God will do that. To come with the attitude of speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I'm ready to obey. Now, when I say that, I know there are many people who are like, Read through the Word of God. You've got to be kidding me. What, what is that like? It's so much simpler than you think. You know, and I'm not talking about, you know, take a nibble here, take a nibble there, but systematically just read through the Word of God. Your ears will tingle. You'll be blown away by what God is going to teach you as you do that. Even as you come around, you read it again and again and again. We, you know, you'll know that, wow, it's just, I've read this before, but I'm getting something else from this. Yes, because the word of God is alive and he speaks into our situations in life and he comforts us and he rebukes us when we need it and, and, and he reproves us and he, and he strengthens us. He does whatever we need. How do you read through the Bible? 15 minutes a day. You can read the Bible in a whole year. That astounds people to hear that. But it's the truth, just 15 minutes a day. It's so easy to write this off. It's so easy to say, 
I have other things I have to do. We don't have anything more important to do than to read the Word of God. A steady diet of everything that's written. Yeah, there are portions of Scripture that we don't, that aren't as easy to read through sometimes. I still, every time I get into the first nine chapters of First Chronicles, I'm saying, Lord, I, I'm sure there's something here for me. You know, speak to me. It's all genealogy. But there, there's got to be something. So I, I find it in other places. So God wants to speak. So we, we asked the greeters to give you a, a sheet of paper when you came in, blue sheet of paper. And it's not a requirement, but it's a great suggestion, if I must say so myself. And that is to, and you have your own way probably of reading through the word, but here's something you might want to try. You don't have to be a theologian to do it. All you have to do is observe what you're reading and write it down. One of the secrets is keeping track of what you're reading. And when you sense that God is making an impression on you. See, I've never heard the word of God or heard the Lord speak in my ear. But I have heard him in my spirit so many times. I've heard, I've sensed, maybe that's the better way, I've sensed him speaking to me through his word. And then when I write that down, did you hear what I say? That was a key part of it, through his word. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't communicate to us through our friends, that God doesn't communicate through us, to us through situations. He does. God communicates to me when I'm cutting the grass. Of course he does. But God speaks primarily through his word. So let's use it. And let's find a way to write down what he's saying to us about just life. Not about great things that are going to happen and then we become the prophets in the church but rather to write down, and you'll be blown away by what God is about to do with your life. I know I'm over, but I just got to say one thing. When, when I first started pastoring, I had a chance to go away from time to time. You know, Joe down in Philly will take some of the pastors in the area away and we'll go away for prayer. And I met a guy who some of you might know from the past, but I don't know his last name. I just met him there. And... Uh, he was, he was still pastoring uh, Calvary up in the Poconos. And he, he told me his testimony while we were up there. And he said that he had memorized through, he had a desire to memorize much more, but he had memorized all of Paul's epistles before he had a stroke at the age of 40. And you know, it's interesting. He said, I can't read, I can't, I can't read a sentence. But what's in me, I can't forget. We never know what's going to happen to us. We never know what's going to happen to us. But feeding on the word of God builds our spirit and our soul that we would honor him and walk with him. Let's stand together. Father, um, I know it's a light law to digest. But thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the way that you show yourself faithful all the time to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that as we seek you, we're found by you. Thank you, Lord, for the way you strengthen our inner being with your word. Thank you for the wisdom that you give us. Thank you for the way that you comfort us when we're down. And thank you for the way that you correct us when we go the wrong way. And thank you for confirming and encouraging us when we're going the right way and all through your word. Lord, pour more of your spirit into us, Lord. May we be more and more controlled by you that as we read your word, that we would know what you're saying to us, Lord. And that our attitude would be, speak, Lord. For your servants listening, I'm ready to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, I want more of you. Living water rain down on me. Lord, I need more of you. Living breath of life, come and fill me up. We 
are hungry. We are hungry. We are hungry for more of you. We are thirsty. Oh Jesus. We are thirsty for more of bless you guys. We'll have prayer counselors up front if you, if you need.